All right, this is the start of the second half of our discussion on climate change. And before we begin, uh, I just want to make something absolutely clear. So we're going to talk about uh, the greenhouse effect, uh, concentration of greenhouse gases. We're going to look at the effects of, of climate change through time. Now, because these things change very, very quickly, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, I'm making this recording in March of 2023. And so because I don't want to re-record this lecture every couple of years, uh, I encourage you that after you go through this um, audio file that you open the PowerPoint presentation and you'll see uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. I try to update them every semester or sometimes I'll add another effect of climate change. So please take a look at the PowerPoint because things change so quickly. Okay, so let's begin and talk about something called the greenhouse effect. Now this is a natural process and without the greenhouse effect, life wouldn't exist on Earth. It is essentially just like a greenhouse. It traps heat in the um, atmosphere, in the lower atmosphere, uh, and prevents it from escaping, thus warming the Earth's surface. So here's how the process works. Sunlight comes down warms the Earth's surface, then a type of radiation, infrared radiation, is then given off by the Earth's surface in the form of something called radiant heat. The more heat it absorbs, the more radiant energy that it gives off. Now, what is supposed to happen is a majority of that radiation then escapes into space. So a little bit is trapped to warm the Earth's surface, but the majority is then re-released back into space. The problem is, is since the Industrial Revolution, about 1750, we've been producing mass quantities of what are called greenhouse gases. And we'll talk about what those are here in a minute. But those greenhouse gases absorb that radiant heat, that infrared radiation, and they prevent it from escaping into space. Uh, I give this analogy, think of those gases as kind of a thermal blanket. So it's trapping all that heat energy and not allowing it to escape into space. That excess energy is then re-radiated back down to the planet's surface, causing a increase in overall temperatures that we call global warming. So the greenhouse effect is not the same thing as global warming. The greenhouse effect causes global warming causes this increase in Earth's near surface temperatures. Now, here's how the process works. Okay, so we have solar radiation comes down through the atmosphere. It's absorbed by the Earth's surface, dependent on color. Remember we talked about albedo uh, earlier on in the semester. That excess energy then is supposed to escape back into space. Here's the problem. So we put this thick blanket of greenhouse gases, once again caused by a lot of artificial activities, agriculture, transportation, energy generation. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now what happens is the heat tries to escape, is absorbed by these greenhouse gases, which then re-radiate back down to the planet's surface. So that excess energy is essentially being trapped in the near um, nearer surface atmosphere causing this overall warming trend that we call global warming. Now since I introduced them let's talk about what greenhouse gases are or GHGs. Greenhouse gases are what are called polyatomic. That means in order to be considered a greenhouse gas you have to have three or more atoms in your structure. These are the gases that are trapping that infrared radiation, that radiant heat from the Earth's surface and preventing it from escaping. Now, there are natural sources of greenhouse gases and there are what we call artificial or anthropogenic sources of greenhouse gases. So you can look at some of the natural sources. The decay of organic material releases CO2 and, and CH4 methane. Evaporation from oceans releases water, H2O is polyatomic. Uh, volcanic eruptions puts a lot of gases, uh, SO2, uh, CH4, CO2 in, into the atmosphere. 
and then were a source of carbon dioxide. Remember we talked about cellular respiration earlier on in the semester. We breathe in O2, we then use foods, digested foods, to breathe off CO2 to get our energy. Now, here's some of the, those artificial or anthropogenic sources. The big one is the burning of fossil fuels. And that's why typically we make the division at 1750. That's really the start of our industrial revolution. When we started burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, which we started to release all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So we often talk about pre industrial revolution pre-1750 and then post after we started burning. We also have industry, transportation, agriculture is another big one in this country that tends to produce a lot of greenhouse gases. Now we have three greenhouse gases over here carbon dioxide CO2, methane which is CH4, and nitrous oxide which is uh, N2O. So all three of these are polyatomic. Now notice something Okay, the red line is the start of the Industrial Revolution when we started burning in mass quantities. Notice that uh, CO2, CH4, and N2O are all fairly steady prior to the Industrial Revolution. Carbon dioxide was about 280 parts per million. Methane was about 750 parts per billion, or PPB. And nitrous oxide was about 270 parts per billion. And then we see this exponential curve. Remember, I introduced that in human growth where we add a lot of these greenhouse gases over a relatively short period of time. The fact that this J curve begins at the start of our industrial revolution is not an accident ladies and gentlemen. That's when we started producing these artificial greenhouse gases in mass quantity. And so a lot of people argue and we're going to talk about this later could some of the warming trend we're seeing be natural? Yeah, we produce natural greenhouse gases, but since the Industrial Revolution, we are producing orders of magnitude more from artificial activities. And so most climate scientists agree that the majority of the warming trend we're seeing today is um, human-induced. Now, you can actually see how greenhouse gases uh, have increased through time. And I want to point something out, guys. This is anthropogenic. So we're not talking about natural sources here. This is all from humans. And so there's, fi uh, there's six divisions, no, five divisions. So we have the yellow is CO2 from fossil fuel and industry. The orange, burnt orange, is CO2. This is the FOLU stands for forestry and other land use. The light blue is our methane. The darker blue is our nitrous oxide. And this thin dark blue line uh, are CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which were very commonly used prior to 1980 in uh, refrigerants, air conditioning systems, even hairsprays like Aquanet used to have CFCs in it. And so you can see, if we go back here to 1970, you can see we were producing about 27 GT. GT means gigatons. So giga is 10 to the ninth. Okay? So we were producing about 27 gigatons uh, in 1970, and you can see it went up to 38 gigatons by 1990, 49 gigatons by 2010 so you can see once again this upward increase and particularly over the last uh, 20 years you can see the slope has gotten a little steeper okay right now uh, like I say I'm making this recording in 2023 I think the last one I saw is we were at uh, somewhere between 52 to 55 gigatons and that's per year so we're producing about 55 gigatons of artificial greenhouse gases per year. Now, as it says here, H2O is the most abundant natural greenhouse gas, usually from evaporation from oceans, and CO2 is the most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas, once again, primarily when we burn fossil fuels. If you remember our discussion on environment and health, we talked about what a hydrocarbon was compound of carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes oxygen, 
Well, that's what coal, oil, and natural gas are. They're hydrocarbons. And when you burn a hydrocarbon, essentially you're adding oxygen. And so that's why CO2 is the most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas. Now, I want to pay particular attention to CO2. And, and once again, if you look at here, this is what CO2 was uh, February 27th of, of this year. So uh, just a couple weeks ago, it was about 421.62 parts per million. And once again, notice, and remember we just talked about paleoclimatology. So prior to 1958, all of our CO2 measurements were using ice core studies. In 1958, we set up the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii that takes direct measurements. So once again, 58 and on direct measurements prior to 58, we did these ice cores. And so you can see fairly steady, okay? And then right about here, here's the start of our industrial revolution. This is when we started that exponential growth. Now I wanna point out this here. These are the direct measurements from 58 to 2006, and you see this cyclic nature. Well, think about it this way, guys, okay? CO2 levels are actually gonna be lower during the spring and summer months because that's when the plants are active and they're absorbing more CO2. So these areas where you see the lower ones, that's the spring and summer months. In the winter months, the CO2 is gonna be higher because the plants are essentially sleeping in, in hibernation. And so that's why we see that little cyclic nature, up and down, up and down. Those are due to seasonal variability. Now, if we look at this, um, who's producing the most CO2, this should come as no surprise, guys. China's number one, okay? That remember, they're in their industrial stage, and so they're trying to grow their economy. And in order to do this, they have to produce more goods, which releases more CO2. We're second behind them. And you gotta remember, China has uh, a fairly sizable population, 1.3, 1.4 billion. We produce the second most, and we only have like 340 million as far as our population goes. Uh, you can look at the others. Uh, India's third, once again, uh, uh, an industrial country. Uh, Russia's fourth, and Japan is fifth. So either industrial or post-industrial countries, those are the ones that are producing the most CO2. Now let's take a look at this global warming. So once again, it's an overall increase in average near surface temperatures uh, of both air and oceans since the Industrial Revolution. And once again, we, we kind of use that date 1750. Now if we look at, and I just want to give you some of the statistic, I, I don't want you to memorize this, but this is how bad it's gotten. So uh, about six years ago, we had caused about one degree Celsius increase in temperatures since the Industrial Revolution. Now I know one degree Celsius doesn't seem like a lot, guys, but you have to remember, what have we been talking about this entire semester? All of natural ecosystems are in equilibrium, are in balance. And even a slight disruption, a slight increase in temperatures can throw that equilibrium out of whack, out of balance, which can have profound impacts. Now, look at the projections, guys. So by the end of this century, so within the next 80 years, we think that it's going to rise anywhere between 2 and 6 degrees Celsius. Those could have disastrous uh, effects on those ecosystems. Uh, if you look at it, temperatures has increased at an average rate of about 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade since 1970. That's when we saw that, that slope kind of steepen. Now, if we look at the top 10 warmest years on record, and once again, guys, this is um, with just 2022 and prior. So obviously 2023 hasn't been included. And once again, check back uh, at with the PowerPoint to see how this changes. But you'll look at this, the top 10 warm, warmest years have all occurred since 2010. Now, a lot of people that argue, oh, this is completely warming, it's cyclic, we have nothing to worry about. Well, that's garbage, ladies and gentlemen. If the top 10 warmest years were cyclic, if it was a natural warming, we'd see some 70s, 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s in there, and we don't, okay? 2016, it was the warmest, then 2020, 2019, 2017, 2015, 2022, so last year is number six as of right now. 
2021, 2018, 2014, and 2010 is just barely hanging on. That tells us something, guys, that this is a trend and we are having a profound impact. Otherwise, there's going to be some earlier years scattered in and there isn't. We're having an impact here. Now, here is temperatures going all the way back to 1860 to about 20, uh, uh, 2002, 2003. And you can see, once again, if we were to draw a line through the center of this data, guys, we see an upward trend. Now, I want to point it out, go back to about 1975. Notice that it looks like the slope has become more severe. That's because it has. So we see an overall warming trend, but that slope within the last 40 years has gotten steeper, which means that these effects are intensifying. Now, in science, we want to know if there's a correlation between greenhouse gas concentration and overall temperature. So this is a plot, once again, 1880 to 2020. The white line, that's the temperature, guys. The blue line are the CO2 levels. And I want you to notice something. And once again, early on, the slope is, is, is a lot less steep, a lot more gentle. But notice that as the temperature slope has increased, so has the CO2 levels. And so in science, can we say anything with 100% certainty? No. We can't say that the carbon dioxide levels have caused this temperature increase. But what we can say is that there's a strong correlation here, guys. As CO2 levels have risen, temperatures have risen. And once again, we've intensified, we've enhanced that greenhouse effect. Now, this is um, the temperature. This is uh, temperatures from 2013 to 2017 when compared to baseline temperatures over a 40-year period from 1951 to 1980. Generally, when we, we try to look at the effects of, of global warming and climate change, we need to compare it to some kind of baseline. And so you can see over those uh, four years, um, we're actually seeing the greatest warming trend is in the Arctic Circle. So the Arctic Ocean is one of the fastest warming oceans on Earth. But notice that Russia, Western Europe, uh, even Canada and Alaska, guys, we're seeing drastic uh, rises in temperature when compared to previous decades. Okay, so let's take a look at the effects of global warming. And once again, these change dramatically year to year, decade to decade. And so look, let's look at the one, the most obvious one. As the earth warms, we're seeing the melting of ice sheets. Now, in, there's two ice sheets on earth. We have the one in the northern hemisphere on Greenland, covering Greenland, and we have the one in the southern hemisphere over Antarctica. So we're seeing these ice sheets melt. We're also seeing alpine glacier. These are smaller bodies of ice, usually found in the upper parts of mountains because of the um, decreased kinetic energy, decreased temperatures, uh, decreased pressure. We're also seeing that we're actually decreasing sea ice, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but sea ice is a necessary component, and as, as the oceans warm, we're seeing that sea, light, that sea ice melt. Now, as these ice sheets, as these alpine glaciers melt, all of that water is flooding into our oceans, which is creating an overall rise in sea level. Now, that's a problem in itself, but we're also seeing that humans, we like to build in coastal areas, okay? Think New Orleans, uh, Florida, pretty much the entire East Coast, from Florida all the way up uh, into Maine. We have major metropolitan areas that are within a foot or two of sea level. And so we're talking about major coastal flooding impacts, which is going to affect millions. Now, we're also seeing changes in the hydrologic cycle. Some areas are becoming hotter and drier, while other areas are actually becoming um, a little bit wetter. We're seeing increasing rates of precipitation. 
Now we're going to talk about the oceanic environment. There's a lot of changes here from uh, temperatures to salinity changing to even something called ocean acidification which we'll talk about a little bit later. What's happening is CO2 is dissolving in our oceans producing something called carbonic acid which is lowering the pH of ocean water. Uh, shifts in oceanic circulation. So as the poles, as the um, polar oceans become warmer, we're seeing that cold, salty water that used to descend. We're seeing that 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 cold, sinking water, as the oceans warm, it's not sinking anymore, which is going to shut off um, oceanic uh, currents, oceanic circulation. Now the big one, the one that gets a lot of attention, especially in the news is we're seeing the increase in the severity of weather events. Now everybody points to hurricanes, but I also want to point out, guys, that tornadoes, droughts, wildfires, even floods are becoming more intensive and all been linked back to this global warming issue. Take a look at a couple years ago in California. Had one of their worst uh, wildfire seasons, I think it was 2019 just horrible burned hundreds of thousands of acres um, now the scary one is disruption to agriculture so as some places become warmer and drier we're gonna see a decrease in agricultural products and remember we've talked about this guys we're still exponentially growing so we're gonna have less food for more people and then we're also going to talk about affects the human health uh, how uh, certain heart problems, uh, uh, certain rises in infectious disease, even mental health is, begin to be, is going to become an issue in the following decades. So let's jump in and let's start with melting of our Arctic polar ice cap. So if you look at this, this slide here shows the loss of sea ice going all the way back to 1980 to 2012. And once again, we draw a line through the center of that data and we're seeing that Arctic sea ice is decreasing. Now this picture shows the red line is what the Arctic ice sheet was, um, the extent of it was back in 1979. The white is where it was in 20, uh, 2003. So we're talking that the Arctic ice sheet lost about 20% of its size just over a 24 year period. So we're not talking about 50 years, we're not even talking about 100 years, 24 years we lost 20% of the ice. Now I know 20%, okay, well we lost 20%. Think of it this way guys, we lost two Texas sized chunks of ice within a 24 year period. Now, you have to remember, earlier on in this uh, discussion, we talked about feedback loops, positive and negative. So, think about it, guys. As we lose more ice, the albedo at the poles is going to decrease because we don't have snow there anymore. And so, what's going to happen is we're going to see more solar energy absorbed, which will then lead to even warmer temperatures. That would be a positive feedback loop where increasing temperatures, we melt the, the Arctic ice, we decrease the albedo, we increase absorption, which is gonna lead to even warmer temperatures. Now here is the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. So once again, that's the ice sheet over Greenland. Now, once again, I give you some numbers here, guys, and I don't want you to memorize these numbers, but I'm trying to give you, trying to quantify how bad this has gotten. So back in, from 1992 to 2001, we were losing 34 gigatons. Remember, giga is 10 to the ninth uh, gigatons of ice a year. This increased to 215 gigatons a year from 2002 to 2011. Now, if you look up the recent numbers, and I did for last year, guys, we were at 270 gigatons of loss of ice per year. So 34, okay, just 30 years ago to 270. What we're seeing is this picture down here on the left, these are called meltwater uh, lakes. 
and every year we're seeing more and more of these meltwater lakes. Now, Greenland should be 100% frozen ice, and every year we're seeing more and more melting, more of these meltwater lakes pop up. If you take a look at the picture down here on the right, lower right, so what they did is in 1992 they had a study and they quantified all the areas that were melting. Those are the areas in orange. They went back 10 years later, guys, and once again, notice how much more of Greenland was melting just over a 10-year period. Now, remember, this is still when we were talking, the first picture is when it was 30, we were losing 34 gigatons. This is the start of that 215th. We're accelerating. We're seeing a lot of these effects become more and more t intense over the years. Now here's the melting in Antarctica. So once again, I give you some numbers here. So this is not quite as bad as Greenland uh, because remember, the warmest area on Earth is actually the Arctic Circle. So our Arctic Ocean is seeing the greatest warming. But it's still gone from 20 gigatons a year, 92 to 1, 247 gigatons, 250 gigatons last year. Now, here's the problem, and here's what a lot of people that deny climate change say. What's happening is we're seeing the greatest warming effects here in the western Antarctica. Okay, so we can see a lot higher temperatures here. We're losing a lot more sea ice. A lot of the ice is melting. But in some parts of eastern Antarctica, we're actually seeing increases to the snow and ice pack. And so people point to that and say, well, we're adding ice in Antarctica. No, no, no. The overall net effect is still we're losing a lot of ice. We're just gaining a little bit over in eastern, but we're losing a whole lot more in western Antarctica. And so once again, we still see losses. Antarctica is not gaining ice. It's losing ice. Now, here's this effect of this is loss of Antarctic sea ice. But we're seeing loss of Greenland sea ice as well. So the amount of sea ice in the Antarctic Ocean, one of the five major oceans, hit a record low last month, guys, February of 2023. And that's why I wanted to include this. Now, we've been taking measurements since 1979. So notice, so here's the, and once again, the sea ice is the ice that's actually floating on top of the water. It's not part of the ice sheet itself. So here's what the median ice sheet looked like from 1981 to 2010. Um, here is um, what it was. Uh, I'm sorry. So this is September 1990. Um, so you can see the white outline is where it was. The yellow line is the median from the three decades prior. And here's what it was just a about a half a year later in February 91. Look at how much ice that we've lost. And so here's the actual number. So going all the way back to 1980 to 2023, once again, it's cyclic. We see some, some years that it's up, um, some years that it's down, but we're seeing this kind of downward trend. Whereas the oceans warm, we're losing a lot more of the sea ice. Uh, here is the melting of, we talked about alpine glaciers. So this is one particular glacier in Argentina. So this is in the Andes Mountains. And so here's what it looked like in 1928. Okay, All of this here is called an alpine glacier. This is what it looked like in 2004. Now the reason these arrows are here, because this is pointing to this mountain, which is the same mountain in this picture. So all of this ice has been lost, is melting, which is what creates this lake. And you can actually see the, uh, term, uh, the terminal end of the glacier all the way up the valley. And once again, it will continue to retreat up the valley as temperatures continue to increase. Now remember, all of that ice, as it melts, floods into our oceans, creating a rise in sea level. Um, we're seeing that just within the last 20 years, sea levels, global sea levels, have risen about three inches. Now, if you take a look at this, and I, I, let's take a look at this graph first, guys. 
So we'll notice that the rate of sea level rise has increased. So from 1900 to 1930, we were gaining about 0.6 millimeters a year. Okay, so look at the slope. That's this slope here. From 1930 to 1992, it had doubled. Notice how steep that slope is. From 93 to 2015, it had um, more than doubled to 3.2, and 2010 to 2015, 4.4. So we've gone from about 0.6 millimeters a year to 4.4 millimeters a year. Look at how steep that slope is. Now, these are projections. Each of these colors represents a specific um, model that is trying to predict climate change. Um, and so in this case, those, uh, what is it, seven models have different predi predictions of how much sea level is going to rise, but it's all positive, guys. So the, the one on the low end is about 20 centimeters rise. The one on the high end is about 57, 58 centimeters rise. So if you look at that, by the end of this uh, by the end of this century, guys, we're looking at a two meter rise, so 6.6 .6 feet rise by the end of this century. Now think about it, guys. If sea levels rise six feet, New Orleans is underwater. Pretty much the entire state of Florida is underwater, and we're talking about major flooding up and down the east states and the Gulf states. Now here's what the sea level rise looked like for about a 20 year period, a little less than 20 years. The redder the color, the more the sea level rose. So we're seeing a, a lot of increases over here in our western Pacific Ocean, but we're also seeing some rises here in the southern Atlantic, even the southern Indian Ocean. Now remember that sea level rise is not just that sea levels are rising, we're talking about global flooding. So once again, we're going to have major impacts from Maine all the way down to Florida on the east coast and from Florida all over to Texas. We're not going to see a lot of effects on the west coast um, just simply due to the tectonic setting. So we're going to talk about a little bit later in the semester uh, passive and active coast. West coast is an active coast. East coast is a, is a passive coast. And so different tectonic settings. So most of the impact is going to be in the eastern and Gulf states. Now let's take a look at uh, changes to the hydrologic cycle. So think about it. We talked about the four major processes earlier. Evaporation, precipitation, runoff, and infiltration. So as air temperatures rise we're going to see more evaporation from the oceans now more evaporation means that we're going to see increased precipitation in some areas so evaporation rates are going to rise precipitation rates are going to rise in some areas other areas like the southern southwestern parts of the u.s and western europe these areas are predicted to become hotter and dry now we're also going to see as temperatures rise, we're going to see changes to snowpack. So think of the Colorado River, guys, the main source of water in the western U.S. states. A lot of that water is derived from the snowpack. So we have uh, a lot of snow during the winter months. That snow melts during the spring months, and that water runs off and enters the Colorado. Well, as temperatures increase, especially in the, the winter months, we're going to see less snowpack, which means less runoff and less water are going to eventually end up in our major uh, streams. This is going to have effect, guys. Um, we're going to see less and less um, water, potable water for drinking purposes. Now here is these changes to the hydrologic cycle. So once again, the brown areas like Western Europe are becoming hotter and drier and the, once again, the southwest U.S., although you can pretty much look at the entire southern parts of the U.S., are becoming hotter and drier. Where other areas, uh, the uh, southern uh, equatorial parts of the Pacific Ocean are actually becoming um, wetter. We're seeing more precipitation 
because we're having more evaporation from the oceans. Now, let's talk about um, changes to the oceanic environment. We're going to talk about several of these changes. The most obvious one is temperature. So since 1961, average temperature of oceans has increased. The Arctic Ocean, as you can see, is where we're really seeing the most changes, but we're also seeing rises in the Antarctic, um, the Pacific, the Indian, and the Atlantic. If we look at it, we think that the oceans actually absorb about 90% of the heat caused by global warming. Now, in addition to not only does this increase the temperatures, but remember we talked about convection, guys, earlier on in the semester. When you heat a fluid, what happens? Well, it expands. And so as our oceans become warming, uh, uh, become warmer, we're seeing an expansion in those water molecules, which is then going to um, exacerber exacerbate the sea level rise. Uh, here are changes to salinity. So what we see here is <coughs> the blue areas are seeing decreases, I'm sorry, increases in, I'm sorry, decreases in salinity. The red, we're seeing um, increases in salinity. So it, this, hopefully this makes sense. The polar oceans, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, they're actually becoming fresher because all of this melting ice is flooding into them decreasing their salinity levels. So less salt content because we're adding more and more fresh water. Whereas our equatorial oceans right here are actually becoming more salty because the temperatures rise, we're seeing more evaporation, which means we're losing that water, which is concentrating the salts that are dissolved. So we're actually seeing differential changes here. Polar oceans are becoming fresher we're decreasing salinity levels, whereas equatorial oceans are actually becoming saltier because of the higher evaporation rates. Now, here's the big one. A, a lot of people point to this, uh, an effect called ocean acidification. So we've talked about the main anthropogenic greenhouse gas, which is CO2. Now, when CO2 gets into the atmosphere, guys, the oceans have a huge capacity to take CO2 in the gaseous phase and produce CO2 aqueous. That means the CO2 has been dissolved and is now part of the liquid phase. All in on, all, about a third of all the CO2 released through human activities ends up being incorporated into our oceans. Now, as more and more CO2 is dissolved, we produce something called carbonic acid. This is a weak acid, H2CO3. So the more CO2 is dissolved, the more of this carbonic acid is produced in the oceans. Now the more carbonic acid, this is what leads us to this ocean acidification. What essentially we have is the pH of ocean water is becoming more and more and more acidic over time as we produce more CO2 in the atmospheres. This leads to more CO2 into the oceans. Now it's not just that the oceans are becoming more acidic, it then in turn has a major effect on marine life. Remember guys, we talked about this when we talked about evolution. Organisms on land can adapt to a changing environment much better, much quicker than marine organisms. So marine organisms are adapted to temperatures, to salinity levels, to pH levels within a narrow range. And any change can have major mass extinction events in our oceans. And we're actually starting to see that today. Uh, something called coral bleaching. So if you look at this picture on the lower left, so the, the left hand side, this is dead coral. The picture on the right hand side, this is healthy thriving coral. So coral actually has a symbiotic relationship with algae. 
So the algae lives in the coral. The coral gets something from that relationship and the algae gets something from that relationship. Well, here's what's happening. As temperature, pH, salinity, as all these are changing, the coral is forced to expel the algae. As soon as they do that, they have just signed their death warrant and the coral then dies and creates this bleached coral-like. This is actually a picture taken in the Great um, uh, Barrier Reef off of Australia and we're seeing more and more of acres of these major coral reefs are dying out because of changes to the oceanic environment due to global warming. Now it's not just that it's killing off the coral, you have to realize that these reefs have very, very high biodiversity. We've talked about this, guys. Coral reefs have very, very high biodiversity. So it's not just the corals you're affecting. It's the invertebrates, it's the sponges, it's the fish, the sharks, the turtles that use those coral reefs as a hunting ground. And so as they die, what we're seeing is a collapse in the entire ecologic pyramid of these coral reefs. Now, here are changes in oceanic circulation. So, remember what's happening in our polar oceans. We have very cold, salty water, which is sinking. That then flows back to our equatorial current, uh, areas, and we deliver this cold water. And so, this is how or why our equatorial oceans actually don't become unbearably warm because we're constantly moving that cold water in. Same thing, we take warm water at the poles and we move, I'm sorry, warm water at the equator and move it towards the poles so the poles don't become unbearably cold. Well, as our Arctic and Antarctic oceans warm, eventually this is gonna shut off that cold sinking water which means that our equatorial oceans are going to become even that much more warm which is then going to increase evaporation and everything else that we've been talking about and so we're going to see major changes to oceanic circulation and i want to point out guys we talked about this earlier but the movement of winds and the movement of currents are the two major ways that heat is transported across the globes. So winds and, and currents. And so when we, we talk about changes, we're gonna talk about changing the movement of heat across the Earth's surface. Uh, here's the one that gets all this attention, the, these extreme weather events. So this one, this top picture is tornado. So, Back in 1950, we had on average about 200 tornadoes during the tornado season. Uh, that runs from March and April through October. Now, if we look at 2000, I think 15 or 14 data, we were looking at about a, um, 900. So we've gone from about 200 to about 900 tornadoes every single year. And here's why we're having more tornadoes, guys, is because global warming is producing warmer air masses. And in order to produce a thunderstorm, thunderstorms, uh, we need to have the uh, severe thunderstorm develop to potentially produce a tornado. So as the air is warm, or, or essentially in order to create a tornado or a hurricane, we need warm, moist, rising air. And as Earth's near surface temperatures increase, we're seeing more and more of that warm, moist, rising air, which is going to lead to more tornadoes and to more hurricanes. This bottom picture here is hurricanes are divided into five categories. Category one is the least severe, is based on wind speeds. So category one is about wind speed of 74 miles per hour. Category four and fives we're talking about in excess of 160 miles per hour. And notice that through time, we're seeing more category four and fives because once again, we're producing more of that warm, moist, rising air from these warmer oceans, which is leading to more intense, more dangerous, 
more severe uh, hurricanes through time. There is a scientific correlation, ladies and gentlemen, between CO2 levels and wind speeds. So the more rich or the, the higher the CO2 concentrations, the higher the wind speeds will be. And once again, as I showed you earlier, CO2 levels have drastically risen from about 280 parts per million to now uh, over 400, uh, what was it, 412 parts per million. And so here are the effects, guys. These are just some of the most severe hurricanes. Here's Katrina and the flooding that it caused. Uh, we had 2008 Ike. This hit the Carolinas, but particularly uh, North Carolina. Here's the 20, uh, 2012 Sandy that caused absolute destruction in, in uh, New Jersey. And then this is the flooding from the 2017 Harvey in, uh, I think it was Houston. Yeah, to Harvey hit Houston. And so we're seeing more and more of these very, very damaging. And it's not just hurricanes. Hurricanes get the attention, but tornadoes, floods, wildfires, droughts becoming more and more severe. Now this it was um, this is kind of a visual representation. What this is, each of those pictures represents an extreme weather event that cost at least one billion dollars. And so you can see this is in 2022, so last year. So here's drought, wildfires, uh, hail in Texas, these uh, severe weather. So it could be uh, thunderstorms, tornadoes. Um, here's flooding. Uh, this was tornado damage in the in the southern uh, states, very very damaging last summer, and then here's your hurricane destruction, and then we had winter blizzards in the northeast. Uh, if you look at this, guys, and once again, I, I give you these numbers not for you to memorize, just I'm trying to quantify how bad it's gotten. But last year we lost 165 billion dollars to these extreme weather events. And once again, as, as the greenhouse effect, uh, greenhouse effect intensifies, as global warming gets worse, we're only gonna lose more money, ladies and gentlemen. We need to mitigate uh, global warming now to, to um, save money in the future. Uh, here's disruptions to agriculture. So remember one of our main things that we sell in the global market is agricultural products like wheat or soy well as areas become warmer and drier this is going to have a profound impact on agricultural yield yield is simply how much food you can produce and so notice um, this picture up here guys at the yellows oranges and reds we're looking at a decrease in agricultural productivity compared to prior to 2003. And so notice the southern US, which has a lot of agricultural producing states, guys, from, from Texas um, all the way into uh, North and South Carolina, um, we're seeing major changes. And so we have this exponentially growing population, and yet we're producing less and less food because of global warming. Now there's other factors as well, but global warming is a main contributor. Okay, as areas become warmer and drier, we can produce less food. Now, we're also seeing a process called desertification. This is a artificial process, guys. So, over farming, essentially trying to put too many cattle heads, which are grazing or um, overgrazing and over farming, actually sucks the nutrients out of the soil. And so this is what desertification is. We, we take fertile agricultural areas and we convert it into barren, arid deserts. It's not a natural process, guys. We talked about the natural ways that we make deserts through Hadley cell circulation and through the rain shadow effect. This is not a natural uh, process. This is a human-driven process where we're taking fertile soil and we're making it essentially useless. Now eventually, guys, this is gonna lead to the collapse of the agricultural system, and we're gonna see um, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people die 
from malnutrition and starvation. Uh, he, this picture here shows the desertification risk. So the areas in red have already been made into deserts. The orange areas are there's a risk for future desertification, and the yellow areas are actually natural deserts. And so we're uh, causing this disruption to the agricultural system. Now this should scare us guys because not only are we going to produce less food but think about what that's going to cause to prices is they're going to skyrocket because less food and so you think inflation was bad in 2022 and 2023 it's only going to get worse as we produce less and less agricultural products. Uh, here are some of the uh, impacts on human health. So as air quality gets worse, asthma and cardiovascular disease is going to rise. Um, allergies are going to get worse. Uh, we can even talk about rise of infectious diseases. So think about as areas become warmer, mosquitoes are going to move in. And mosquitoes are the carriers of a lot of infectious diseases like malaria, uh, dengue fever, um, Rift Valley fever. We had Zika virus about 10 years ago. We had that outbreak in Florida. Uh, Waterborne diseases are going to become more common as our water quality uh, decreases. Now, we're also going to see mental health is going to decrease. Anxiety, despair, depression over the state of, uh, of affairs. And so we have this all-encompassing major um, changes to our both our physical and our mental well-being. Now, once again, I, I shouldn't have to go through this, but once again, there's a lot of climate deniers that are out there that are still claiming that what we're seeing is completely natural and we don't have to worry about it. Once again, I, as garbage guys. So let's look at both sides of the coin. So let's look at facts, not my opinion, but facts. Temperatures have been increasing since the Industrial Revolution. I showed you that because greenhouse gas concentrations have been rising. Humans have added about 40% more CO2 in the atmosphere than would have been there naturally. Okay, What we see here is the main source is actually power generation. So electricity produces the most CO2, followed by industrial process, transportation, and agriculture. Those are the four big ones in the US guys with power generation being the number one. So that 40% extra CO2 is human activities. They're not, not natural processes. So the fact is greenhouse gas, artificial greenhouse gases have been increasing. Thus the greenhouse effect has intensified which has led to an overall rise in, in um, temperatures. These are not my opinions, guys. These are stated, documented, scientific facts. Now, here is what the climate deniers cling to. What they say is, uh, it's all natural because the Earth has been much warmer than it is today. And that's true. During the Mesozoic, okay, remember the Mesozoic era, the age of reptiles, temperatures we think were anywhere between 5 and 7 degrees warmer than it is now. And this is what they cling to, guys. Oh, it's been warmer in the geologic past, so all we're seeing is natural cyclic fl fluctuations. That's bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, I go back to those exponential curves of CO2, CH4, and nitrous oxide, how they were fairly stable before the Industrial Revolution, and then they absolutely just almost go up vertically. You can't tell me that that is a natural process. It's not all derived from human activity. So that the climate deniers, ah, it's, it's completely natural. That's garbage, ladies and gentlemen. They're not looking at the facts. Now, let me be honest. Could some of the warming trend we're seeing today be natural? Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. Is all of it? No freaking way. It's mostly human induced. Now to prove that to you guys, okay, I have a couple of graphs here. So the black is the observation uh, of temperature, something called temperature anomaly, which is measured temperature based on that baseline that we talked about. 
So the black line is what we've actually seen over time. The red and blue lines are models, climate models. And I want you to notice something. From 1960 on, notice that the climate models are nowhere near reality. That's because they only used natural processes. And so they only modeled natural process. Notice they actually have a dip in temperatures where we have an incline. So this should tell you something, guys. By modeling only natural processes, they don't come close to what reality is. Now, when we take both natural and human forces, now look at the red and blue lines. They fall right on top of the actual observed data. Okay, let's go over here. So here is the uh, global trend temperature trends from 1951 to 2010. Now, we, this was only using natural processes. Does this look like this? It's not even close, ladies and gentlemen. This is nowhere near the observed data. Whereas this bottom one is both natural and human forces. And I want to point out that this is a better match, but once again, it still doesn't match reality. But this is a hell of a lot closer to reality than this is. And so the people that still are out there, and there's still a lot of them that are denying climate change, they have economic reasons to do so, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it. Republicans are your main climate deniers. And if you look at it, the major sources of political campaign contributions to the Republican Party are coal, oil, and natural gas companies. So they have an economic reason to try and pull the wool over our eyes and say, uh-uh, nothing to see here. It's all natural. That's garbage, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? A garbage that they're trying to feed you. We've known about global warming since the mid-1970s. Okay? Why haven't we tried to do more? Is because, unfortunately, okay, the coal and oil and natural gas companies, the ones that have caused global warming, they're paying our politicians to keep us in the dark. Absolutely disgusting, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what can we do? Okay, We're never going to eliminate the impacts of global warming, but how can we mitigate them? How can we lessen their impacts? Well, the first thing, the best thing, is we need to reduce the amount of our fossil fuel use. Now, I know we haven't talked about energy yet. That's coming up. But we'll talk about it. Um, about, I think it's 82% of our energy budget comes from fossil fuels, guys. Uh, about 11% uh, renewables and about 7% nuclear. So most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. We need to reduce that amount. We need to increase nuclear energy, which doesn't produce greenhouse gases. We need to increase our renewable energies, solar, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric. And we especially need to do it in the pre-industrial and industrial countries, guys. So pretty much Africa, India, Mexico, China, we need to increase these renewable energies. We also can conserve certain natural ecosystems which absorb carbon from the atmosphere. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a process that has, has garnered a lot of attention in the last couple of decades called carbon sequestration. This is when we remove the carbon from the atmosphere and we store it in what are called natural sinks. And we'll take a look at some of these sinks a little bit later on. And then there's actually something called geoengineering strategies. This is where we actively try to manipulate the climatic system. And we'll talk about there's two main types of geoengineering strategies. But here's the big thing, guys, is we have to increase our renewable energy sources first in this country. And then we have to try and help the rest of the world, especially those pre-industrial African nations that simply don't have the economic resources. Okay, So we need to go to more hydroelectric solar, wind, geothermal, okay? 
Uh, here's conservation of natural ecosystems. So simply by protecting certain biomes like forests or prairies, they contain vegetation that naturally absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere. So by trying to reduce deforestation, by protecting these natural ecosystems, they're naturally scrubbing or absorbing a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. Here's this carbon sequestration. So there's actually three types. There are what are called geological sequestration, there's ocean sequestration, and there's terrestrial sequestration. So geological sequestration is taking the CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it in things like unminable coal beds or salt layers or even depleted oil and natural gas reservoir rocks. So essentially we're pumping the CO2 gas in there and we're storing it for a, a certain amount of time just to get it out of the atmosphere to prevent it from enhancing the greenhouse effect. Now ocean sequestration is a bad idea. This is taking it and pumping it into the deep oceans but as we looked at that would then intensify ocean acidification. And then terrestrial sequestration, this is just planting more trees that remove the CO2 naturally from the atmosphere. Now let's take a look at these geoengineering strategies. There's actually two types, something called solar radiation management and carbon cycle engineering. Let's start with solar radiation management. In this case, what we are trying to do is reduce the amount of solar radiation that is absorbed by the Earth's surface. The, the more we reduce it, the less radiant heat or the less infrared radiation is given off by the surface. Now, we can do this several ways. The first is um, we try to uh, essentially seed clouds. We try to make more clouds in the atmosphere. The energy when it hits a cloud is going to bounce back up because clouds are white, have a high albedo. Or we produce aerosols. So aerosols might be things like uh, droplets of, of water uh, or even small particles, uh, solid particles. These would absorb or reflect that incoming solar radiation. Now the carbon cycle engineering is what we're trying to do is modify the carbon cycle, which is the main driver of climate change, so that CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. So these can occur by planting more vegetation or something um, we're, we'll talk more about when we get to energy, the use of what are called air scrubbers. So in a, in a let's say we have a coal-fired power plant, before that exhaust goes into the atmosphere, we use these air scrubbers which actually absorb some of the CO2 before the exhaust goes up the chimney. So it doesn't matter which one, guys. So solar radiation management, we're trying to reduce incoming solar radiation. Carbon cycle engineering, we're trying to modify the carbon cycle so that all reduce the amount of, of carbon released to these natural ecosystems. So here are certain areas. So here is the cloud seeding. This would be solar radiation management. There, I don't know how, how realistic these are, but there have been ideas about putting mirrors in the upper atmosphere or the, the outer parts of space to reflect some solar radiation. Once again, not sure how realistic that is. Or uh, putting aerosols, which are reflecting com coming solar radiation. So these are all solar radiation management. Uh, here are these carbon cycle, uh, planting more trees. Um, here are these um, air scrubbers that actually capture CO2 from the atmosphere. There's also something called the iron hypothesis. What is done is we seed the oceans with iron. This encourages the growth of phytoplankton, and phytoplankton absorb me more CO2 from the atmosphere. So these all down here would be the carbon uh, cycle, uh, the uh, carbon cycle engineering. The other ones are the solar radi radiation management. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. I always, um, unfortunately, there are still, once again, those people that deny climate change exists. So I always like to, to leave you with this uh, joke that suggests uh, global warming is very real. 
And so that is the end of this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, um, please check the PowerPoint, especially this PowerPoint, periodically uh, because things were changed with effects or melting or even CO2 levels change drastically from year to year.